to a point, and then they yeah. screwed it up. If you'd been cute. Well, Peter, it isn't every day I get to talk to somebody on the back lot at Universal Studios, but it's very nice to be with you. And uh, I am so excited. I, I knew, of course, about the Kong exhibit, and all that I read and even saw on television doesn't begin to do it justice. I mean, it's something you really have to experience. So uh, congratulations to you for pulling this thing off. Uh, I'd like to ask you, um, first of all, are you the person who had to come up with the scenario Yes, I uh, had the, the basic concept that we started from uh, that we would not just encounter King Kong, but we would be set up for him by coming into a New York street scene where he had already been and had done some things. So you'd be emotionally prepared uh, at, by the time you did meet him. And then a fellow named Bob Ward and I laid out the attraction from there. Did you have other scenarios, like maybe three or four or five, and then you chose one? We had many, many different scenarios. In fact, we had a whole different show planned at one time uh, where we were going to see Kong far away. Because typically, when you make these big animated figures, they don't look real good up close. They look not alive. But we built the face of King Kong first, just as a test, that 10 foot, it's about a 10 foot face. And when we saw how good he was, we couldn't believe it. We thought, geez, you can stand in front of this guy for two or three minutes and you just, you just can't believe it. It looks like he's alive. So then we changed the show to be one where we came right up next to him. And I also felt that people would like that a lot more. If you were next to him for a long time, you could take pictures of him, you could see him, you'd really flip out, and people do. Well, I wanted to ask you about that because it is so realistic, and uh, I'm thinking about little kids particularly. Uh, who maybe don't know about Kong as uh, from the movies that, like we do. But what are some of the unusual reactions you know about? Well, my son, who's five, and his friends, who are five and six, think that King Kong is rad. That's their word. And, uh, and although they did think he was scary, but they all went through there. Nobody cried or anything like that. What we tried to do in the attraction, and why I think it's okay for even little kids, is it's so awe-inspiring that it's more than, you know, been frightful. So, uh, and it seems to work pretty well. Uh, we also put in little touches like uh, he's got banana breath, and when people smell the banana breath, they generally crack up. So, that kind of cuts the tension. I'm a person who's very fire conscious, and I come from a city, uh, Dallas, where they have, I guess, the strictest fire codes of any place as far as theatricals are concerned. So I, I know this is safe, and I know it's something that you surely gave a lot of thought to, but for people like me, what can you tell me? Well, we have live fire in the building. What we do, and we have a very strict fire department here in the city of Los Angeles, what we do is we fireproof everything around the area, and then we isolate the fire so that it isn't in contact with anything that's flammable or even anywhere near anything that's flammable. And then we have a safety computer control system that senses if there's any fault in the fire system. The basic fire system is natural gas. And it senses if the gas pressure is low or high and shuts it off automatically. And basically, they won't run the attraction. And uh, if anything ever defeats that safety system, we also have an emergency stop that the tram driver can hit, the doors open, and you're out of there. OK. I felt perfectly safe, but I just had to get into that discussion a little bit. Well, again, Peter, congratulations. It's spectacular. Oh, it's thank great. You. It's just great. Thank you for talking with us here at Universal. Thanks. Okay. Tape's rolling. Bob, I read and saw on television all about this King Kong exhibit, and you know, you just have to experience it. I mean, it's you can appreciate what you see and read, but it, you just have to experience it. What a thrill that is. No kidding, it's just great. I wonder, as far as you're concerned, how do you rank it among all your many achievements? Is it in the top five, top ten? Where is it? That's a very good question, because uh, the type of engineering that uh, I've been experienced with uh, I'd have to say, never repeats. In other words, 27 years of working with Disney and now working with our group of creators over at Sequoia Creative, uh, you never get good at anything. Uh, that is to say, you never do anything twice. Everything that you do is a one of, totally unique, and usually so different from one another. Example, uh, I was asked to design Abraham Lincoln uh, for Walt Disney for the World's Fair in New York City. 
That was the first of the real audio animatronic figures. I was asked to design the first monorail train in America, uh, designed uh, four other versions of it. Uh, Michael Jackson asked me to uh, design a special lighting device when I knew nothing about rock and roll shows, but I got to learn about it. Uh, got asked to design the spacecraft that flew over the uh, Olympics in the Coliseum in 1984. Then get asked to design a fire-breathing dragon here at Universal. And if somebody said 30-foot uh, foot, uh, gorilla, I would say that's just normal business. <laughs> so in other words, you can't rank it. Each one is different. In other words, uh, the flying saucer was my best flying saucer. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was my best Abraham okay. Lincoln. <laughs> I got uh, But King Kong, I think, um, probably is very special from the standpoint that you know it is a legend. In other words, it never, it never goes away uh, generation after generation. Uh, so I know there's something terribly unique about it and I watched the reaction of people on the tram because I was there on that first day when that first tram went through and I saw the reaction of the people. And I still see this every day as it uh, goes on. So I know there's something that maybe I don't understand about King Kong even though I'm the fellow that got to design and build it. Um, so it's special in that I want to see uh, where this is all going to lead to. Maybe, uh, maybe he is a, a, a terribly important, uh, as Hollywood's biggest star after all. He has 29, count them, 29 facial expressions. You could do wonders with Clint Eastwood. Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> the great stone face. <laughs> I love him, but he's the great stone face. But um, I, I truly didn't know that there could be 29 facial expressions. Well. There are 29 uh, motions include uh, body motions as well as the uh, facial motions, but he is uh, capable of a lot of expression. Uh, he was talking one day here before the show opened to Jonathan Winters, and normally we operate the uh, figure with a uh, recorded program after we uh, program it. But we had a couple of fellows who were doing programming that day and were able to manually operate the gorilla by running the individual controls which could control the uh, head motions and the facial expressions in real time. And this was a real uh, joy to watch uh, King Kong talk to Jonathan Winters and watch Jonathan Winters talk to King Kong until the two literally got immersed in one another. One's a machine and the other, I don't think uh, Jonathan Winters is a machine, but the two of them were interacting just as if they were, were two alive creatures. Well, that does show the ability uh, that if you design a machine so it has those capabilities, uh, it's literally endless, the kinds of uh, motions that you can do with it, if you've uh, once designed them into the figure. What are the maintenance problems with Kong? As of now, absolutely none. In fact, uh, I just talked to the head mechanic here, uh, George, a few minutes ago to uh, make sure he was still running, and George was all smiles. He says, Gorilla hasn't given us one lick of trouble. Uh, in fact, they kind of kid, and they call him uh, the old Maytag. Uh, <laughs> And it's like we sit up at Sequoia and I think uh, something's got to go wrong and I sort of sit in there and think like a Maytag salesman or repairman, they're never going to call and I'm never going to come down and see something break. He's not going to blow any microchips or anything? <laughs> I don't think so. It's just a good, ordinary mechanical machine but in a very, very unique uh, shape and effigy. That he is. Mm -hmm. Bob, thank you so much for talking with us here at Universal Studios. I've enjoyed it tremendously. Right, good. Nice to meet you. That was fun. That was great. <laughs> yes. King Kong stands three stories high. And if this tour doesn't work out, they're going to turn him into a condo. I'm sorry, Kong. I'm sorry. I didn't really mean it. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Have you ever seen an orthodontist? Okay. Are we still rolling? Okay. This is Bobby Wygant with King Kong at Universal Studios for Channel 5 News. Okay.